The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Let me tell you what I heard from the family of this Rosh Kolel. He's a Rosh Kolel in Bnei Brak, a great Tamil Chacham. And one day he was coming home, Ben Darim, and you know, he was going through the mail, and he grabs the whole stack of mail. And he brings it upstairs, and as he's making his way up to his apartment, he's fingering it through, and he stops dead in his tracks, and he's looking at an envelope with the return address of Switzerland. He says to himself, Switzerland? Schweiz? In Hebrew. I don't know anybody in Switzerland. Who? It was a very fancy envelope. It was one of those big envelopes. So he makes his way into the apartment, and he starts ripping through the mail, and he rips open the envelope from Schweiz. And as he's going through this envelope, he pulls out another envelope. He says, wow, look at that. He rips open that envelope. And he looks inside, and there's another envelope. Remember when we were kids, they had those babushka dolls, you know, that... <laughs> today, I told that today. They look at me like, what are you talking about, Rabbi? I said, don't worry, one day they'll make an app. All right, whatever. Anyways, but he was ripping on envelope after envelope, till finally he came to the envelope with the wedding invitation, and he pulls it out, and he opens it up in some beautiful paper, linen paper. And he sees with a beautiful monogram. And quickly, he zips through the wording, you know, with gratitude to Hashem, you know. Blah, 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 blah. He comes down to the bottom. Who are these two families? Do I know them? He looks at one family. No. He looks at the other family. No. Never heard of either of them. That's probably a mistake. They probably were looking for someone with the same name as I. He probably had a famous name. Say, I, they told me not to mention the name, so I can't. But the famous name is the same name as I. And he also lives in B'nai Brock. So probably they got the buildings mixed up. So you know what? It's funny because it's made out to my name and my wife's name. What's the chances that there's going to be another guy in the city that's going to have the same name with the same wife's name? But it's clearly a mistake because I don't know either of these families. Okay. A few minutes later, his wife comes home. And he tells her, you know, Davar Muzar, something very odd. Take a look. We got a wedding invitation from Switzerland. and I don't have a clue either of the families. Why would someone send me? I don't know them. The wife says, really? Schweiz, Switzerland? He says, yeah. She says, let me see. She goes to open up the barrage of envelopes, and as she reaches down, she sees there's another envelope all the way at the bottom, past the invitation, that the husband didn't even pull out. So she reaches down deep into, you know, Mary Poppins' bag. She pulls it out, and she rips open the final envelope, and she pulls out two round-trip tickets from Tel Aviv to Switzerland. And each ticket was made out one to the husband's name, and one to the wife's name. And she looks. Yes, Kartisim. There are tickets here. The Schweiz, to Switzerland. And he loves mommy now. I don't believe it, she tells him. Look at this. She was smiles ear to ear. And the husband says, wait one second. We don't even know the people. And she says, Mach Batli. I'm going to Switzerland. Two free tickets. Are you joking? How many times does a Rosh Kolel's wife have a shot to go to Switzerland? Go to Switzerland. He says, Tagi, relax. Wait a second. We don't know the people. She says, I don't care. They sent us tickets. We're going to Switzerland. He says, wait one second. Before we jump on any plane, you know, by the return address, there's a phone number. Let me call them. Let me find out who we're talking about. It. She says, okay, yeah, go ahead, call. I'm holding on to these tickets. He said, okay, go ahead. He gets on the phone and he calls Switzerland. A man gets on the phone. Shalom Harav. He says, Shalom. Mize. The voice on the other side says, I don't want to tell you my name. Ma? What do you mean? I see your name on the, on, the, on, the, on the invitation. I don't want to tell you my nickname. You might recognize me. Okay. So tell me, do I know you? He says, yes, I know you and you know me. He says, I don't understand. If I know you, how come I don't recognize your voice or your name? He says, Harav, listen. Asking you as a favor to me and as a favor to Hatan and Kala. Please, take the tickets that I gave you. Come to Switzerland. I will only tell you in person my story. And believe me, it'll be worth it. The rabbi said, I don't exactly just get on a plane for some strange voice who's asking me, please, to trust him, to go all the way to Switzerland. He says, Harav, listen, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, trust me. You know, now, ladies, typically, if someone would have called me and sent me tickets and said, come to Switzerland, I have a wedding, trust me, I don't think I would have gotten on the flight. But maybe it was a combination between 
something struck this rabbi that was very genuine with the voice over the phone. And it pushed him to actually consider to go. Or maybe it had to do with his wife that was still swinging the two tickets in the air, screaming, We're going to Switzerland! Yep, so it was a combination of both. But whichever way you want to slice it, the family member told me that he was moved. And he felt that there was something here. And he followed up. And at the end of that week, they were on a plane to Switzerland. They landed in Switzerland airport. And they came out. And there was a magnificent limousine waiting for them. And the Rosh Kolel stands there and says, This is probably a mistake. And the driver of the limousine, an Israeli, he's standing there holding a sign with the rabbi's name on it. And he's looking around. There's no other rabbi with that name except me. And then the driver sees that the man is actually looking. And he says, Wow, I, 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 I'm in the middle of a class. I'll call you back. He says, Wow, you know, it's really for me. He turns to his wife. The limousine's for us. And she looks at him. Again, on your day. She jumps into the limousine. He jumps into the limousine. They drive off to the countryside. As they go out to the Swiss countryside, beautiful resort homes, estates of the wealthiest of Switzerland, they come up to this magnificent house. I mean, this was a house with acres and acres, you know, with the houses that, the gates open and close as if there was no mean or manner to it. They drive in. They come around the circular driveway up to the doors. They come up. They knock on the door. And there's a butler that brings them in. The wife looks at the husband. He has She says, oh, we're in a way. The husband is thinking, what is going on? The butler tells him, please wait inside in the master's study. He'll be downstairs in a few minutes. The Rosh Kolel walks into the study of this man, and it was basically the size of this room. And it was wall-to-wall svarim, literally wall-to-wall. The rabbi was impressed. Such a library of svarim, it must be a very learned man. Or maybe he's a book collector. So he wanted to see. There's only one way to tell. He walked up to the, to the svarim shank. He walked up to the bookcase, and he pulled down a sefer. And he opened up a random sefer. And he saw all over the Sefer, there were writings, quotations, Haga'ot, Ha'arot. Wow, this guy is a real Talmud Chacham. Who is this guy? Swinsolent? With such wealth, with such prestige? And he knows me? I don't have a clue. They wait for a few minutes, and then the master of the house comes downstairs. And he's in a smoking jacket, and he has a long, grayish white beard. And he walks up to the rabbi from Bnei Brak, and he gives him a hug. And the rabbi is hugging and thinking to himself, oh, what a guy. <laughs> He's hugging a stranger, but okay. And then finally the rabbi says to the master of the house, please, enough with the mysteries. I don't know what possessed me to come out to Switzerland, but please, now that I'm here, who are you? What's going on? So the master looks at the rabbi and says, I see you don't remember me. He says, no, I'll tell you, rabbi, but listen carefully. When I was 16 years old, I was the son of one of the wealthiest Swiss Jews in the world. I grew up with such comfort, such luxury, such wealth, that in yeshiva they told me, you're so pampered, you'll never get to really learn Torah. Every time you lift a finger, you have a servant running to your beck and call. To be able to be great in Torah, you have to sacrifice. You have to work. You have to sweat at it. You have to give your heart over to it. Here in Switzerland, it's not going to happen for you. You're way too pampered. You want to become a real Talmud Chach? You got to pick yourself up. And you got to go to Eretz Yisrael. Go to the great yeshiva of Panovich in Bnei Brak. Here it's not going to happen. And by the way, ladies, I just want to tell you, so many conversations I have with mothers here. And they always tell me, Rabbi, what's the big deal? Why can't my son learn here? Why are you making me send him to Israel? Why can't he learn in America? There are yeshivot there. They learn in shuls at night. What's the problem? The problem is that he goes to yeshiva by Lexus, and he comes back by Land Rover, and then he goes out with his friends in Corvettes. It's not happening. There's no, there's no sacrifice. There is nothing that's going to make a guy really work. Thank God we have a very affluent life. But because of that, there's so much distraction here. They need to get away from the distraction. They need to go to a place that they can detox and just learn. And that's what they told this Swiss boy as well. And he took their words. 
And he went to Bnei Brak. But ladies, in those years, he walked into the yeshiva in Panovich, and it was already in the summer, and it must have been 100 degrees. And the yeshiva at that time did not have air conditioning yet. So he walked into a steam bath, and he was walking up and down. He was hardly, he was, you couldn't breathe in the Bet Midrash. And he said to himself, oh boy, there's no way I'm going to survive this. I'm coming from a, an air-conditioned castle. I'm going to be able to make it here? No way. But he pushed himself. Let me try it. And then when they showed him the dormitory, where there was a room the size of a cubicle with two bunk beds, where literally there was no closet space, nor drew space for anybody. He says, there's no way I'm going to survive here. And he was the outcast. He was the outcast of the yeshiva. And because he walked around so finicky and so touchy-touchy, nobody wanted to have to do anything with him. And he was angry at the world. He had no havrutot. The roommates wouldn't talk to him. He was miserable for two weeks straight. Till finally one day, he said, that's it. He told the rabbi, I had enough. I am going to walk into the Bet Midrash, walk up to the Mashgiach and tell him, listen, I tried it. It's just not for a Switzerland boy. I'm going home. I can't survive under these conditions. It's not happening. Maybe for the Israelis, I can't do it. That was it. So he says, I walked into the Bet Midrash of Panovich. I walked right up the aisle. And as I was going to the Mashgiach to tell him, I'm out. An older Bachur sits up, grabs my arm, and he says, hey, I've been meaning to talk to you. Come here for a second. You know, I've been watching you for the last two weeks. And I saw that, Mamash, you're miserable. I know that you're coming from Chutzlaretz, and probably you're not used to the ways and, you know, the comforts here in Israel. But I want to tell you something. It's like everything in life. You just got to give it your all, and you'll survive it. You'll get used to it. I see there's something special on your face. I see you could be a tremendous guy. But Hazit, you have no, you don't have no habrutot. And I realize that the guys in your room don't talk to you. You must be miserable. Listen to me. This older guy was one of the best guys in yeshiva. He turns to this Swiss bachur and tells him, I'm ready to drop my chavruta for two weeks. I'm going to learn with you for two weeks every day just to get you on your feet. Not just that. I'm going to pull you out of your dormitory room and I'm going to bring you to my room. My room is the hashubi room. You know, in every dormitory, there's the room of the older guys. That's the corner room generally in the hallway. They have two windows. You don't just make it into a room like that. You got to be in the dorm for years till you make yourself up with a lot of protexia and a lot of pull till you finally get that corner room. This kid, this Switzerland kid, was brought straight into the room by this older guy. And suddenly, they became friends. They start to talk to each other. And they were chabuta together. And when everyone in the yeshiva saw that this kid from Switzerland was hanging with one of the top guys in the yeshiva, overnight he became a success story. Overnight, everybody said, wow, if this guy is giving this kid the time of day, he must be something special. So suddenly, this kid from Switzerland, he says, talking about himself, he says, I started to get so many friends. So many guys wanted to learn with me. So many guys thought I was something wow. And after two weeks, that guy put me on my feet. He gave me my life back. He cut me off the minute before I was going to bail out. After that, he went back to his chavruta. I had chavruta to my own. I left his room. I went back to my room. I became one of the most popular guys in the yeshiva. And I ended up continuing and learning in Panovich for the next few years. I got married in Israel. I stayed in Kolel for another 15 years. And then I came back to Switzerland. And now, now I'm the chief rabbi of Switzerland. Now all the yeshivot and all the batiknesio are run through me. That guy saved my life. Because he took a minute. And instead of everybody else's bad, funny looks, and I had nothing to do with anybody, this guy saved me and built me up and inspired me and gave me the right words at the right minute. He gave me a life. He says, do you know what would have happened to me if he wouldn't have stopped me? I would have been a nobody. And Switzerland would not have had a chief rabbi. He turns to the rabbi from Nebrak and says, do you know who that guy was? It was you. You were the one. And although you might have forgotten me because we're talking 30, 40 years ago, although you might have forgotten me, I will never, ever forget you. Every night I close my eyes and literally your face is in my head. That was the guy 
that built me up and gave me a future to live right at the moment that I was about to give up. Now you understand why I brought you out here. This is the power of a few well-placed words. This is what the rabbi was telling us. Those words were meant to build worlds, meant to build people, to give them a life, to give them hope, to give them potential, to give them chizuk, to give them a gav, to give them back their confidence, their self-image, their self-worth. And instead, says the rabbi, chas v'shalom, those words are pointed against each other and they stab into each other. And because we don't stop the stabbing of words, the stabbing of the blades of the goyim yet goes on. Just this morning I heard there were another three stabbings in Rishon Litzion. We got to stop it. And then it will stop. We got to become more sensitive. We got to realize the power and the potential of words can do to build people in their lives and how sensitive a wrong word can destroy a child. It can destroy a spouse, a husband, a wife, a friend, a neighbor. Those words, they're gifts. They were meant to be powerful, godly messages. Let's not mess them up. Bezat Hashem, we should be zocheh. At the moment that we take the blade out of the word, the moment we take the blades out of our words, is the moment that the blades of the goyim will be taken away from them. We'll see at that moment in Achdut in Klal Yisrael, a love that everyone has each other's best interest, inspiring each other to something of the greater people we were meant to be. That will be a moment that we can finally see a Geula. Thank you for listening. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to Inspire.org.